All right, Shalom, Shalom, peace and blessings. Now let's get straight to it. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Zechariah, the fourth chapter. And um, we actually won't get every single aspect of this chapter because uh, we start talking about Zerubbabel and we probably need to uh, go in separately about who's Zer- who Zerubbabel is and, and Joshua, but we will talk about the, the main meat here on this chapter, which is the golden candlestick um, and the olive trees, or what they say the golden lampstand. Uh, we're just going to talk about what this means for us. So to prep us real quick, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's get the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 13 and verse 26. Good. It's the book of Sirach, chapter 13 and verse 26, and it reads, a cheerful countenance is a token of a heart that is in prosperity, and the finding out of parables is a wearisome labor of the mind. All right, so we know finding out parables can be hard, but we do have to take our time to make sense of the word, right? Um, and speaking of parables, I want to grab... Matthew 13 again. We got this last lesson, but um, I do want to grab this again. Let's get Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13. Uh, It's the book of Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing hearing they hear not neither do they understand. All right. I speak to them in parables. All right, who was he talking to uh, when I say he, Yahweh Shai? Who was he talking to there? His disciples. All 12 of the disciples were Israelites. All right, he was talking to his own people here. Them is referring to those of us as, you know, that has an ear to hear, all right, that wants to understand the scriptures, all right, and those that see not, of course, and hear not are those that do not understand. All right. But speaking of since Yahweh said that he speaks in parables, let's grab Hebrews 10 and 7. The book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 7, and it reads, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So if Yahweh speaks into parables and he's written in the volume of the book, that means parables are written in the volume of the book, right? So we know that even in the quote unquote Old Testament, that we have to be mindful of these parabolic, um, well, the scriptures being in parabolic form, even in the quote unquote Old Testament. So we know a lot of our people, they, they read this here in Matthew 13 and thought that the only parables really, or at least that's, that's kind of their mindset, is to only try to break down the, the parables that Christ directly stated while he was here on earth. But we know that he's in a volume of the book. So we need to understand the other parabolic meanings of the scriptures as well. So that's just a kind of prep our spirit because we're going to go into, um, you know, several parabolic meanings here in this chapter. So I just want to prep our spirits for that. A lot of times what we see on the surface, there's a lot more going on when you really take your time with it and break it down. All right. Now, with all that being said, we got our prep out the way. Now let's, let's go in. Let's get Zechariah chapter four. And we'll start at verse one. Done. It's the book of Zechariah, chapter four, and verse one. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Okay, keep going. And said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. 
Okay, so we see an image here. Now, this is the prophet Zechariah that's communicating with an angel. It's normally how the Most High communicates with his prophets uh, through an angel, and then that prophet gives out the word um, to us. When I say to us, is here in this, this written form, of course. Now, he sees an image just like we read about in the book of Revelation, the, the many images that John the Revelator saw. This is Zechariah seeing a physical image that represents something else. So we have a candlestick of all gold, all of gold. Okay, that's what um, I'm pretty sure most of us already know this. This is referring to what we call a menorah. Now the word menorah, I don't believe is actually in the scriptures, but it comes from the word used here, um, which is candlestick. It's a transliteration. If you don't know what that means, a word, but it just means if you look at this word here, it's basically a English version of the, the Hebrew word menorah. All right, a lampstand. All right, now let's get this image here. Um, it's probably Esau doing, but it at least gives you something physically to look at here of what was going on here. All right, you have um, a candlestick, all of gold right here, a bowl on the top of it right here, uh, seven lamps there on. These are the seven lamps right here. If you count them, that's seven. And seven pipes to seven lamps, which are all, which are upon the top thereof. So all this means something here, and we're we're gonna jump into it. All right. So this is that bowl, and this is oil coming from the two trees here, which are two olive trees. All right. Uh, read that in verse three, actually. Zechariah chapter four, verse three and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. All right. Now let's get the physical description of this menorah, and then we're going to further break it down. Let's get Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31. Book of Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31, and it reads, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work, shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. So this is a pure gold, all right, this candlestick. Now this was in the Holy of Holies, all right? This is in the book of Exodus. So we read in the book of Exodus, um, at least, you know, around this time, you had the children of Israel building up the Ark of the Covenant. This is where they uh, worship, where they did sacrifices and did the work of the Lord, essentially. Well, we know the Levitical priests were the ones here, but this is the building up of the, the temple and the covenant here, the Ark of the Covenant and, and the Holy Temple, the Holy of Holies. Um, if you don't understand what, what that means, just it, you, you kind of have to look at this chapter and um, to, to get that understanding of what I'm referring to. But either way, um, we, we see the golden candlestick. This is the same candlestick mentioned here in Zechariah 4. All right, we, we have to understand that, you know, the candlestick and, and things of that nature is not mentioned here by accident. It's not out of nowhere, it has a specific meaning. All right, keep going. Uh -huh. Verse 32, and six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Okay, so that's why I had seven. You have one in the middle and then three coming out each side. Now, this is what a menorah, the golden candlestick, this is what it actually looks like. Now, if you look at the quote-unquote Jewish people, that have, um, you know, taken our culture to be 
at least in a, a sense they've taken our culture because it's, it's not what they portray today is is not what we do but they they pretend they're fakers or usurpers but anyway uh they that believe they have nine if i'm not mistaken brothers they have nine candlesticks which is just off wow. because it's yeah it's nine it, it makes no sense it's right here you know very plainly put how many candlesticks you're supposed to have so you know <laughs> why would you just go off like that that's just what they do man that's they be letting you know they're not the children of the book but uh you know people don't pay attention because they don't actually open up the oracles here all right so this is a physical description we could continue to read it but uh, we got the point this is what it looks like essentially this is not in all its glory of course but just to give you an idea all right now let's talk about what it actually represents we got the physical description let's talk about what it actually represents let's get revelation chapter one and verse 20. it's the book of revelations chapter one and verse 20. the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. All right, so we know this candlestick, these candlesticks, they represent the seven churches. What is the seven churches? Um, at this time, this was the seven churches of Israel that um you had your Howard Shah, you know communicating with john a revelator of our people um after he was you know gone from this plane but just to to bring it back to you know what we need out of this chapter right now this represents the nation of israel the seven churches why is that the the number seven represents completion because we know that the Most High, through his angels in Yahweh Shai's son, created everything in existence in seven days. When I say days, that's kind of quote unquote, it's really seven periods, but just well, to keep it simple, in seven days. So it represents completion. All right. Now, let's get a little bit more on that. So we fully understand what's going on here. I think I got this pulled up again. All right, yeah, let's let's uh, get Revelation 1 and 13. All right, it's the book of Revelations, chapter one and verse 13. So like, read, yeah. Let's get 12 first and 13. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Okay, these are the seven churches right here, the seven churches that are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, uh, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All right. Now he turned and saw the seven golden candlesticks. So, and we already know from verse 20, this is referring to uh, the churches, meaning the children of Israel. You don't see the word church being referred to as any other nation of people. The word church, first of all, doesn't does not mean a, a building, a gathering of citizens called out of their homes into some public place, an assembly. OK, an assembly of the Israelites. All right. Now, when you see this, this is them going off in a Christian sense. There's no in a Christian sense. What, what is in a Christian sense? No, it's in a biblical sense. This is what the definition really is. OK, so we know this represents the children of Israel, these seven churches. And when you see the word church again, the Bible is actually always referring to Israelites. OK, we, we never saw a church of Elamites, a church of Edomites um and things of that nature they're not mentioned they were around at this time when i say not the word church but there were gatherings of people of other nations of course but they weren't mentioned because the bible is, is for one one set of people that's why they don't break down their history all right you don't see 
too much Edomite history in the Bible, only enough to what we need to understand what we need to know. All right. So let's get verse 13. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. All right. And then we saw Yahweh's physical description. This is how we know, you know, he was a so called black man based on Revelation 14 and 15. At least that's one of the ways we know. Um, but for what we need today, Yahweh Shai is in the midst of these seven, seven candlesticks. That's how we know this represents the children of Israel, even unto today. You know, the seven churches at this time, but that still represents the whole nation of Israel. All right, let's get Matthew 18 and 20. The book of Matthew, chapter 18 and verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. All right. This is referring to that same assembly, that church, the, the assembly of the Israelites. All right. Yahweh Shai is in the midst of us. This is church that we have right now. All right. Because two or three are gathered together in his name. All right. This is how we know that the golden candlestick here is referring to the nation of Israel. All right. So that's, this is a vision that Zechariah is seeing, behold, a candlestick, all of gold. Even though this is literally what he's seeing, he's describing what he's seeing, this is referring to the nation of Israel, okay, in a symbolic form. All right, and the precepts give us understanding on that. This is how we know that. All right, if you just read this by itself, you might just think, oh, it's just a candlestick, you know, that's pretty much it. He just saw a candlestick. But it's a reason that even the candlestick itself was used. We're about to get that in a second. All right. So just to fully, you know, cement here that um, this is referring to the children of Israel, this golden candlestick, uh, get Numbers chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. It's the book of Numbers. Chapter 8 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. Okay, that's, that's the seven lamps that's on the, the golden candlestick there. Keep going. And Aaron did so. He lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlesticks, as the Lord commanded Moses. All right, keep going. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof was beaten work according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses. So he made the candlestick. Okay, so this is the same symbology here. Well, no, this is actual physical. This is literally what they used to, to light, you know, where they were in the, uh, the Holy of Holies. That's what they used for light. Um, but what I'm saying here, this is the same candlestick that Zechariah saw. This has always only been referring to the children of Israel. So if you hear someone bring this out and this is, oh, God's people. No. All right. This is not referring to just anyone. This has always only been referring to the children of Israel. All right. Don't let nobody, uh, you know, tell you otherwise. All right, I was going to get into this. This is Aaron. Aaron is a high priest. Or he was a high priest. And we know that Yahweh Shai is a, a, a priest forever after order of Melchizedek. That's just to further get the point. But now I want to talk about um, why was a candlestick even used? Like, what does that even mean? You got to think about it for a second. It makes perfect sense. You just got to think about it for a second. Let's get the book of Sirach, chapter 26 and verse 17. The book of Sirach, chapter 26 and verse 17. As the clear light is upon the holy candlestick, so is the beauty of the face in right age. Okay, so 
the holy candlestick, there's a clear light upon the holy candlestick. So just let's think about this for a second. Why does this represent the children of Israel? We know that number seven means completion. It, re it represents the nation of Israel, but why was this used? What does a candle, what does it do? It holds. So like it, what'd you say? Go ahead, go ahead. I Kind of. A candlestick holds a light. All right. A candlestick holds a light. Let's get Proverbs 6 and 23. Hans, book of Proverbs, chapter 6 and verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. That's the way of life. The commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. So a candlestick holds the light. The children of Israel hold the light. They're commandment keepers. They hold the commandments. They're the light. You understand? That's why a candlestick is even being used. This cannot be referring to anyone else. All right, so Zechariah is seeing a vision of the children of Israel, at least in a symbolic form. Let's get 1 Corinthians chapter... First Corinthians, like First Thessalonians, chapter five. We'll start at verse four. It's the book of First Thessalonians, chapter five, and verse four. But ye brethren are not in darkness. That day, it's like it. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, I got this verse too because it says, "Brethren," we know Paul was talking to his brethren, which are the children of Israel, which he said so himself. You know, in Romans 11 and 1, and also in Romans 9, uh, 1 through 4. All right, keep going to verse 5. Verse 5, ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the light nor of darkness. All right, we are the children of the light. The children of Israel are the children of light that are light holders. So the candlestick <laughs> represents those of the children of Israel that hold the light, the commandments, all right? Because our nation were given the commandments, all right? We know that we've gotten that precept plenty of times. It's a lot. Uh, uh, were you, uh, you was bringing out Matthew 5 too? Or? I didn't grab that, but that, I, I think I know where you're going. Uh. Fourteen. Okay, yeah, I knew it was right there. All right. All right. It's the book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Con, con, con. Uh, verse 15, too, was going into the candlestick. You know what I'm saying? But uh, that's just pretty much... Uh, you know what? What the good brother was bringing out. Um, the children of Israel are the are the are the light of the world. You know they're the command commandment keepers. Uh, beautiful point. Beautiful point. Absolutely glad that you added this, brother. For real. So it, it says it right here. You see the same symbology. All right. Neither do man light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a candlestick, you give it light unto all that are in the house. So, yeah, how was all right? Verse 16 Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, you see the light, you see the good works, mm -hmm. keeping the statute, laws, and commandments. Those are the good works. All right, you see the candlestick. See the light, all right, and that light shining before your own people, that they may see your good works before men, before the children of Israel. Oh, ye men of Israel, right? In, the, in Acts chapter 5. So, yeah, I wish I didn't say this for no reason. He didn't use this particular um, words for no reason. All right, this is all symbolic of the children of Israel, all right? So again, um, the laws of light, 
uh, we hold the light because we hold the laws. We were given the laws. All right, does that make sense? Y'all y'all picking up what I'm putting down here? Con. All right. Con, con. So now let's go back. And uh, I had a little history here too. That's right, I had a little history here. Let's pull this up. Just to show you that, you know, Zach Zachariah 4, you know, has always been referring to, well, the menorah has always been referring to the children of Israel here in Zechariah 4. Um, this is a picture from the Ark of Titus. This is not a picture. This is actual uh, a mural that you will see in the Ark of Titus. I believe it's still there. This is when the children of Israel were taken over by the Romans. Okay, and the Romans did this, they, you know, they inscribed this as a sign of victory when they took our people into captivity. All right, so this is them actually, and you can see how big this menorah is. All right, look how the size of the, the men are here in comparison to this. It was a huge menorah that we had in the land. And this was them taking our stuff away when they took over. You know, they took us in captivity, at least afterwards. All right, so this is this nasty Edomite here, Titus, which is uh, the father of dimension. And he started the, the downfall of the uh, what they call a quote unquote Roman Jewish war. All right. So, and I pulled this up just for one quick point. I just thought about it. Like, isn't it crazy how they never mention this in history? The quote unquote Jewish people, they never mention anything like this. Like if they really thought that this was a symbol for their people, why don't they talk about this? This is never mentioned in history. We weren't taught about Vespasian and Titus and Dimension and these other Roman emperors that took over our people. So, it, you know, that's just further proof. You know, if you're hearing this and you're like, man, I don't know if we're the Israelites of the Bible or not, it's, the clues are all over the place. You just got to really, <clears throat> you know, you got to really think about it. And in history, kind of. That was a very good point, man. Also, um, and just to kind of go along with what you said, they also never talk about um, uh, the so-called, uh, well, well, the Israelites or the Jew, Jewish or the Jews or whatever they want to call them, uh, being conquered by the, by, by the Romans. You know, they never talk about that. They never talk about that. Never. You know, we were in captivity at the time that Yahweh was on the scene. And you can see that just by reading through the Gospels, uh, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you read those books, you see that we were in captivity at that time. And they never talk about that. If that was their people that was in captivity, why don't they bring that out? The only thing they talk about is that contrived event known as the Holocaust. That's the only thing they want to talk about. Anything else, they don't claim it because they know that this wasn't actually their people. You know, they know that. It's just all, you know, nonsense. Again, the, the so-called white man is a master deceiver. All right, he's not intelligent. He's just the head cunning man on planet Earth. He knows how to write a script to make people believe lies straight up in your face but again um this was a a sign of, of victory but again you see this is real life you know what i'm saying this is actually here in the ark of titus all right so this is actually inscribed there but again this is just a relay back to a lesson not to get too deep off into that but now let's talk about um, the oil. All right. But 
let me not get ahead of myself. Let's actually read it though. Let's get a. We want to skip down, and yeah, we got the two olive trees, and then um, which verse I want to bring out? Actually, just read a uh, verse two one more time. All right, it's the Book of Zechariah, chapter four, in verse two, and said unto me, "What seest thou?" And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all, uh, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps therein, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Okay, keep going. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. All right, keep going. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Okay, you keep going through verse 6. Verse 5. Then the angel that talked that talk with me answered and said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. All right. There's some very important dropped on us right here in this verse. So we see here that we have these two olive trees. Why an olive tree? Because an olive produces oil. And you, you can't have a lamp. This is, this is a lamp, right? You can't have a lamp without oil, right? You have to have that oil to, to burn that lamp. And without the oil, the lamp can't produce any fire. Now, this is all symbology on, on another level, okay? What that oil represents that we see here is the Holy Spirit. All right, but let's get that though. Let's get the proof. Let's get the book of, first of all, what I, what I had here. Okay, I was just going further to the point. Okay, let's get First John chapter two and verse 20. Uh, it's the book of First John chapter two and verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Okay, ye have an unction from the Holy One, ye know all things. What is the word unction here? Let's look into it. All right, an unction. Chrisma. What does this word look like? Or right, right here in the, in the English. If you add a T, that's Christ, right? Because the word Christ means anointed. All right. And what's, what do you normally anoint someone with? All right. Oil. So an unction, charisma, or charisma here, anointing, unction, anything smeared on. I'm not even going to front like I, I know that. Unguent, <laughs> ointment. Usually prepared by the Hebrews from oil, from oil, you see, and aromatic herbs. Anointing was an inaugural ceremony for priests. So you're normally anointed with oil. Now, on the physical sense, we know that's done at church and things of that nature, but that's because they're missing a point. This is spiritual, all right, because we've already established that we're likened to a lamp uh, because remember the law is a lamp. The commandment is a lamp and the law is the light. This is how you light your light. But first you gotta have the oil. The Holy Spirit gives you the oil to light the lamp. You see what I'm saying? You can't have your fire. You can't be on fire with no oil, meaning 
you can't be hot for the word if you don't have the Holy Spirit giving you that understanding. Because mm. the spirit is, is what makes you wake up in the morning wanting to read the word. Or that makes you not want to go off because you can have the commandments. Everybody got a Bible. Everybody got the Bible app. Um, everybody got a Bible in their house. I remember I had a Bible for years and I promise you that thing never got touched ever, ever. I would take it. I don't even think I took it to church. I would just try to rely on the, the little loose Bibles that be in the pews and stuff. Um, I never opened it. So you can have the word, but if you don't have the oil, what does it matter? You can't light up your candle. You can't light, you know, you, you can't get on fire without the oil. That's the way a lamp works. All right, so that's that Holy Spirit. Let's get more proof, though. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 12. Book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 12. And it reads, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Really quick aside, the word ready here, and I have to look at the, the translation, uh, was actually brown. The word brown was legitimately used here uh, for worry in, in certain translations for, for King David. But it says here, David anointed. All right. He was ready with all uh, of a beautiful countenance. Now let's get verse 16. Verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. All right. He took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. From that oil, the oil represents the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. All right, we know, uh, we should know that what they call in the church system, at least in a, a lot of the church systems in Christianity, they call, what's called the Trinity, uh, which is unbeknownst to them, is actually modeled after uh, pagan deities. Because there is no such thing as a trinity, you know, in the scriptures. But the Holy Spirit is a huge element. It all goes together, which you need to be complete, you know, as a lamp, a holder of the light, to be a light to the world, to be a candlestick. You have to have this Holy Spirit. All right. And, you know, just, you know, just saying this real quick, you, you ever went, you know, a day or a day or two or whatever your standard is, it could be two, three hours, whatever your standard is, you go that long without reading or, or you know, doing what you need to do for the most high, whatever your standard is, whether that's a chapter a day, four, five chapters, or just, you know, just reading and, and trying to get some understanding. If you go that long without the word, what you start to feel like you start to feel you know kind of empty your spirit feel a little low why is that because you're running out of oil all right your spirit low if you if your oil low your light can't burn all right you a candlestick <laughs> and they have different writings and one church say a week with that the uh, no if you go with that read it makes one week i might not word it right but you know what i'm getting at this i know you exactly what you're saying. Read the Bible, yeah but yeah uh-huh <laughs> Yeah, I believe, uh, what do they say? Uh, whatever it is, or without reading for a week makes you weak or, or something to the, to the extent. I know what you're saying, though. And that's right. 
Um, even though, of course, that's kind of a, just a saying they, they put out there, but it's true. You definitely don't want to go a week without reading at all. Um, you really want to be in this thing every day for your daily bread. But when you don't, you'll feel weak. You know, that's, that's because your oil is starting to run low. You know, you got to get that oil back up. Let's get Psalms chapter 119 and 105. It's the book of Psalms, chapter 119 and verse 105. And it reads, None, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right, it's a lamp unto my feet, but that lamp needs oil, all right, to light your path. Now you can't see. Without no light, you can't see. Spiritually, you can't see, all right? It all comes together. Let's get Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Book of Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There's no light. All right, you have, if you don't have a word, but you also don't have the oil to light that lamp, that candlestick, you have no light. You can't be hot. You can't be on fire. You know, this is a fire. You can't have no fire, man, without without the word man without this oil all right so did i um i didn't even grab one of them seven days without the word make one week Yes, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, that's all it was. Okay. Absolutely. Register All right. Let's get Isaiah 61 and 1. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61 and verse 1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You see, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Most High, is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Anointed. You'll see the word anointed associated with oil, and also that oil associated with the Spirit of the Most High, or the Holy Spirit. You know, what what you read in the quote unquote New Testament as the Holy Ghost, which is really the Holy Spirit. All right, but one of the main, I thought I had this already up here. One of the main witnesses that we have here is Matthew chapter 25. Let's get that. Huh. The book of Matthew, chapter 25, and verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. All right, the kingdom of heaven. So this is giving you insight. Yahweh is giving you insight in parabolic form on how to get into the kingdom of heaven. All right, liken it to 10 versions, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The 10 versions are, well, you know what? We, we're not going to get fully into that. Um, basically, remember, Israel is like into a likely, I mean, a likely, a, a, a comely woman. All right. So 10 versions means you're undefiled by other doctrines. But let's just keep going. Verse two. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Let's see what the let's see what the five wise and the five foolish said. Keep going. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Okay, so you got the scriptures, but you ain't got the spirit. All right, you got the lamp, but you got no oil. Keep going. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. You building up your spirit. You took that oil. All right, so that's what we try to do every day. We're trying to take that oil in our vessels. 
without lamps. All right, because if you're a lamp without oil, you're just an empty vessel. All right, we know that that means that you're walking in a congregation of the dead, pursuing the Proverbs 21 16. Keep going. While the bridegroom tarry, they all slumbered and slept. Wow. So the foolish ones, they sleep like a lot of our people are today, unfortunately. All right, keep going. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the, br the bridegroom coming. Go ye out to meet him. This is referring to Yahweh He's the bridegroom. All right. And we're the bride. That's why you like into a version because you, you only have one doctrine, one bridegroom. All right. So at midnight came. This is the time of the day of the Lord. There was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Go out to meet Yahweh Shai. Keep going. Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Okay, they trimmed their lamps. Keep going. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. You see, the foolish did not take any oil with them. They didn't build up their spirit until Yahweh Shai came back. At that time, it's going to be too late. We don't know if that's going to be tomorrow, you know, 100 years, 10 years, five years, a year from now, whatever the case is. We don't know. But we do know that it's not right now at this very moment, at the time I'm speaking this right now. So we have time to put that oil, to build up our spirits, to put that oil in our lamps. All right. So we can continue on, but. We got the point here. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. All right. So we got to be building up that oil, that our Holy Spirit. Now, let's, let's get the last, the last symbology that we see here. And, you know, we had the two olive trees. So let's, let's get verse 11 in Zechariah 4. The book of Zechariah, chapter 4, and verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are those two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereon? Because you notice we, we, we haven't broke down what these two trees actually are yet. All right. So Zechariah asking himself, you know, what are these two olive trees on the right side and on the left side thereof? Keep going. Verse 12, and I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive trees which brought the two golden pipes empty, the, go the golden oil out of themselves? See, this is where we get that oil from. This is what I was looking for er um, earlier. So these two olive branches, they are providing the oil for the lamp. All right. This is how this lamp is getting this oil and the, the way it is staying lit. And you can read through uh, 13 and 14. Verse 13, and he said unto me, and he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then, he, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Okay, the two anointed ones. Who are the two anointed ones? Because the two olive branches are the, the two anointed ones. Okay. So what does this represent? You see, these are the golden pipes that was mentioned as well. So what does that represent? Now, first, we have to understand that men are likened unto trees. In the scriptures, right? Let's get that real quick, quick refresher. Um, Mark chapter 8 and verse 24. It's the book of Mark chapter 8 and verse 24. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Men as trees walking. Men are likened unto trees. That's another parabolic form to represent a man because a man needs, um, well, a tree needs water to live, right? And that 
That's that living water, which is the word, all right, rooted in the foundation of the word. All right, let's get Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. Book of Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 7. And it reads, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope is and whose hope the Lord is. See, it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. Now let's see what it says next. Verse 8: For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green. And shall be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Oh, that's deep. Shall not be careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So you always gonna be doing the work. Remember, a man is known by his fruit, the fruit that he bears. All right, so you never cease from putting out the good works, but the point here is that a man is likened to a tree planted by the waters. All right, those are the living waters. That's the word. All right. And last testimony here. Uh, a witness, rather, is Isaiah 61 and 3. All right. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61 and verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Okay. To point unto them that mourn in Zion. This is Israel, okay? That they, or Jerusalem, that they might be called trees of righteousness. You see? So men are likened to trees of righteousness when they have that living water and they plant it, all right? They root it into the word. Just like a tree is rooted into the ground, you root it into the word. That's your foundation, all right? And then we know that Yahweh Shai is also likened into you know, the morning star, you also need that, that morning star as well to grow, all right? It's all symbolic. And why is, you know, why do we see all this? So that way that those that are meant to get it are going to get in. Those that don't have the patience and, and, and don't want to deal with it, it's going to fly right over their heads. That's why we have the precepts here, man. But to get back to the point, where are these two olive branches and uh, the two olive trees, the two anointed ones, is referring to, again, like we went over how many lessons now, the, the past four lessons, the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. That's who the two olive trees represent. All right, because we talked about how Trees are likened into men, but really the men of the Lord, not just any man, the Israelite man, the elect, the hopeful elect now, or the elect. So we see that they're providing this oil for this lamp, and it's two of them. Now let's get Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 16. Okay, Ezekiel. Chapter 37 and verse 16, and it reads, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. This is the northern kingdom. This is the southern kingdom. What symbology is used here? A stick. Or, or a branch, like we just read. All right, keep going. Verse 17, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Keep going. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, wilt thou not show us 
what thou meanest by these. All right, and then let's get 19. Verse 19, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, with, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. All right. So we see the sick of Joseph, which is the hand of Ephraim and the tribe of Israel, his fellows, and the sick of Judah. These are the branches, the, the two olive trees. Okay. And also, Revelation chapter 11. Here we go. 11 and 3. Uh, it's the book of Revelations. Chapter 11 and verse 3. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Uh, two witnesses. Okay, I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, let's get verse 4. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay, you see this is linking up right now. The two olive trees and the two candlesticks, these are the one and the same, the two witnesses. So the two witnesses <clears throat> are the northern and the southern kingdom representing in, in whole that seven um, gold-plated candlestick, okay? Which is, we already... Um, established this is representing the children of Israel, the whole nation, all right, in this completion, all right. Also, in a sense, this is Yahweh Shai as well, because we know that the word is a light, and Yahweh Shai is the light of the world. So, ultimately, this is representing Yahweh Shai as well, all right, if that makes sense. This is this is us, you know feeding our oil in and he's providing the flame all right but this you, you see this all comes together when you see the word stick you might think that's you know that means nothing but it does um a lot of the words used in the scriptures they have a very specific meaning so um that's that's what we have here um, in Zechariah chapter four. So those two olive branches and the two olive trees, they represent the Northern and Southern kingdom. Cause we know that that's who the, well, that's who both covenants are for. All right, it's been a minute since we gotten this. So just pull it back on the screen. We've gotten it before, but let's get it again. Hebrews chapter eight and eight. All right. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's literally the northern and southern kingdom. All right. Keep going. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. Keep going. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So we know that this has not been completed yet because can brothers give me, include myself, can I just go in Genesis through Deuteronomy and give you the, the entire, you know, volume of all five of those books just straight off the top of my head? No. Nope. Like you saw in the book of Eli? La, uh -uh. which means no. So we, we can't do that yet. The laws are not in our minds as of yet. From a spiritual sense, it is, but you physically will be able to know the entire volume of the book. And that's speaking of that book, that's why that was put there in the end of the book of Eli, because that represented him 
Eli, him being a man of Israel, knowing the entire law and the entire volume of the book just in his mind. I mean, the man was blind. And he he wrote, he was able to call out the entire volume of the book from Genesis to Revelation, all from the top of his head, word for word. Imagine that. That's just crazy to even think of. But what we need here is I will make with the house of Israel for these days, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember Judah, southern kingdom, house of Israel, northern kingdom. All right, we know from the rest of this chapter as well that this has not happened yet. The, the second covenant, okay. So the second covenant has not been fully established yet. We know that it has began because Yahweh he died. So at least one of the reasons he died, it was so that the second covenant could come into effect. All right. Well, it hasn't been fully established yet. We won't get that until he comes back. And then all these prophecies will come into play. All right. Will be fulfilled rather. All right. So. Since this is referring to the northern and southern kingdom, we know that these are also the two witnesses as well, the two olive trees. All right. So, you know, I know the Jehovah Witnesses, they say that, you know, the, the witnesses are just anybody that adhere to their doctrine, but that's no, that's that's false as well. All right. And you know, they don't have precepts for that, but we do. We just went over it. So um uh, that, that's pretty much it. So we got a little history on a menorah. We got the physical description of it. We got why uh, a menorah or a candlestick is even used for the children of Israel because you're a light holder. Um, we're the children of the light. The law is the light. All right. And then we also got what the oil is. The oil represents the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to be able to understand the word. All right, and have that light. And then we also see that the two witnesses and um, by association here in Revelation 11, I mean, Revelation, yeah, Revelation 11 chapter, verse three and four, we see that this also refers to the two olive trees, which are the Northern and Southern kingdom. All right, so let's brothers have any precepts or anything they wanna add, I conclude. Great lesson, I'll, great lesson, I'll pray this. All right. All right.